Welcome back to Paper Things. This week we'll be reading chapters 24 through 27. Chapter 24, Photographs. The first time I wake up, I've forgotten that we ever left Jana's. My old flannel nightgown, the one I love even though there's a hole in the elbow, is wrapped around me. I pull the down comforter up to my chin and glance around the room, listening for familiar voices, wondering whether it's a school day, whether Jana is going to pop her head into the room and tell me to get my sweet butt out of bed. And then I remember. I remember throwing up on Mr. Chandler's leg, burning up in the nurse's office while waiting for Jana to come. I remember Jana placing an arm around me and leading me to the car. I remember her suggesting I sit in the front seat and handing me plastic, a plastic shopping bag in case I needed to throw up again. I wanted her to tease me, to say something funny to help make up for the humiliation of what had just happened, like Gage would have. I wanted her to say, oh, I've missed you, but she didn't. The second time I wake up, I don't have to remind myself of what happened. My stomach is doing a repeat performance. I lean over and puke into the trash can. I don't want to think of Jana, of where she might be or what she'll say when she comes into the room and it smells like vomit. Instead, I, I think of Gage. What time of day is it? Did he go to Head Start to pick me up? Has anyone told him where I am? But these worrisome thoughts mix with my feverish dreams and I fall back to sleep again. I can tell now that it's morning. Jana is standing over me with a spoonful of canned pineapple juice. It's what she always gave us for an upset stomach. Canned fruit juice only, until we declared we were starving. Then she knew it was okay for us to put, to put something in our stomachs. I lean up on my elbows to get the juice into my mouth. I feel like a baby bird when she feeds me this way. Gage, I say as soon as I've swallowed. I can tell by her expression that his name shouldn't have been the first thing out of my mouth. Thanks would have gone over a whole lot better. He knows you're here. I left a message on his phone before picking you up. Thank you for coming to pick me up, I mean, I say in, in case she thinks I'm just talking about Gage again. Jana nods. You've got the flu, she says. The nurse said it was going around. I groan weakly and let my head fall back onto the pillow. The pillow with its clean, white pillowcase, one that still smells mountain fresh, even though I've no doubt drooled all over it. I can't stay home today, she says. I've got to get to work. Do you think you can fend for yourself? Now I'm the one who nods. I've never stayed alone when I was sick before. Jana, a medical transcriptionist, always worked from home typing up reportings from recordings that doctor sent her. I'm 11, I remind us both. I'll leave this here, she says, placing the can of pineapple juice next to me. See if you can't make it to the toilet if you need to throw up again. May I watch TV, I asked. I expect her to say no. She's pretty strict about staying in bed on sick days, and I'm not even sure I want to watch TV. But asking feels just like old times, when Jana was my guardian and I would ask her permission to turn on the television or play a game on the computer. What would Gage say, she asks, and leaves the room. I can't decide if that was a serious question, if she wants me to act like I would if Gage were in charge, since I'm living with him now, or if it's just her way of saying, you're not mine anymore, or what do I care? I listen to the sounds of her leaving, the emptying of the coffee pot, the rinsing of her breakfast dishes before she stacks them in the dishwasher, the click of the dishwasher door. She pounds her feet into her boots and then the kitchen door shuts, once loosely, then tightly. I think about getting up and making sure that the door is locked, which is silly. Jana always locks the door. I feel drained, empty, like the coffee pot. I look around my old room, which hasn't changed much in the months we've been gone. The white furniture is the same, my books are still on the shelves. The only difference is that the framed pictures are gone. 
There is no picture of me and Sasha on my eighth birthday. No picture of seven-year-old Gage holding me when I was born. No picture of me and Jana and Gage on the day she took us to court to get official guardianship. I remember telling Sasha once that Jana had adopted us and Gage correcting me angrily. Not adopted, he'd said, his face like storm clouds. Adopting is when someone becomes a parent. Jana is just our guardian. I never understood why this upset him so much. Jana did all the things a parent was supposed to do and signed all the same forms. And who could blame her for not wanting to become our parent? After all, our track record with parents wasn't very good. I get up to use the bathroom and then I walk around Jana's house, running my finger along familiar and always dust-free surfaces. The window sills, the glass coffee table, the granite countertop. Despite the fact that I should only be sipping on pineapple juice, I look in the baking cupboard to see if there are any chocolate chips. Whenever Gage and I were alone, we'd snatch some, always careful to take only a few so Jana wouldn't be able to tell. Jana does have a bag of Nestle's semi-sweet morsels, but it isn't open. I place it back into the cabinet in the exact place. Gage's room is upstairs with Jana's. Both of their rooms are larger than mine. I start to look into Gage's room, but then I stop myself. Seeing his things might make me feel sad. And what if Jana has changed his room, moved his things? That would make me even sadder. I peek into Jana's room where we've never been allowed. Jana called her room the sanctuary, a place where she could be alone and do the things she used to do BK before kids, like painting her toenails and working on her scrapbooks. I see that there on the end of her bed is a neat pile of magazines and catalogs. She used to save them for me and I, I wonder if she still does. I sit on the edge of the bed, careful not to make wrinkles and look through a mini Bowden. There's a page that says Bonnie for babies and it has the cutest little kids I've ever seen. There's an African-American toddler boy with a red snowflake sweater and a smile that makes my body feel stronger. There's a white toddler girl in a colorful dress with two sleepy eyes on the front who looks as if she's about to take her very first step. I decide to cut the kids out and add them to the daycare where Miles and Natalie go. And then, just like old times, I'm going to spread my paper things all over my room. I'm going to play for hours. I bravely tear the pages out of the catalog so neatly that Jana might not even notice. Before leaving Jana's room, I wander from corner to corner, peeking at the pictures of her parents and her sisters on the wall, and the items, perfume, lotion, earring tree, cotton balls, placed ever so carefully on her bureau and vanity. I wander over to the table against the wall and where she keeps her scrapbooks and her carefully organized scrapbooking tools. There are lots of brightly colored papers and scissors that will cut the paper edges with zigzags or curly scallops. There are also stickers, lots and lots of stickers, of things like barbecue grills, tall glasses of lemonade, and watermelon. Clearly, Janet is working on summer pages in her scrapbook. I used to wish I could use some of those stickers for my paper things, but Janet's scrapbook stuff was always off limits. In fact, I've never even looked through any of the books. She used to say, someday when you're older, I'll show them to you, but she never did. Now I'm home alone for the first time and I can't help wondering what it was that she didn't want to share. I know it's wrong, but I can't stop thinking that this might be the only chance I'll ever have to see her scrapbooks. And she did intend for me to see them someday. I sit down in her chair, pull it up to the table, and open the nearest one. The book begins with old baby pictures, the corners of the pictures rounded like the ones Mama had of her and Dad back in high school. It takes me a second to recognize Jana's mother, who always asked us to call her Nana. She's much younger in the pictures and looks like Jana does now. The baby must be Jana. Then there are pictures of Jana as a toddler taking her first steps, Jana as a preschooler asleep with a book on her chest, 
Jana at her six-year-old birthday party riding a pony. I feel a pang as I flip through the scrapbook. Gage and I don't have baby albums of any kind. Mama always said that our dad wasn't home long enough to take any pictures of us when we were babies, and she was just too plain tired to take any herself. But someone at some point took a few pictures, because I remember seeing ones of baby Gage running around the house without clothes, me in a high chair with baby food smeared all over my face, and toddler me crying because Gage had left the room. I wonder whatever happened to those pictures. I flip through more of the scrapbook. There are pages with tickets, notes from friends, some report cards, all A's and some A pluses, and a picture of Jana in a straw hat with a huge polka dotted bow next to the one of my mother with her pipe cleaner hat. Eventually I come to Jana's high school years. There's a page for field hockey and I recognize my mother in a few of the pictures. Another page is devoted to prom. Janice pressed her corsage into the book. Even all dried and brown tinged, it's still pretty. I take a closer look at a picture of Jana in her prom dress to see what the corsage looked like when the flowers were fresh. It was a burst of pink daisies tied up with a hot pink bow. The bow matches the ribbon around Jana's lacy pink and white dress. Jana looks so young and she's wearing an, wearing an expression that I've rarely seen on her face before a full smile which lights up her whole face. I look over at her boyfriend, wondering who this guy was who made Jana so happy. At first I think it's Gage. What? Slowly though I realize that it's not my brother's face staring back at me, but my father's. Holy moly, Jana's prom date was my dad? I stare for a good long while as if expecting the image to change. Eventually though, I turn the page. Next come pictures of Jana and my mom. I half expect them to look tense in these pictures. Surely mama couldn't have been happy that her best friend was going to prom with her future husband. But in every picture they're laughing, usually with their arms around each other. I trace my fingers over mama's smiling face. She didn't look that different when I knew her. Thinner and sadder, sure, but not much older. She was only 32 when she died. I continue flipping through the pages. There are more pictures of Jana and my dad. Lots more. Jana and my dad at other dances, hugging at a basketball game, smiling at Nana's Thanksgiving table, showing off their Christmas presents. My confusion grows as every memory passes by. My parents were married right after high school. When did Jana and my dad stop being a couple? When did my mom and dad start? And why didn't anyone ever mention that Jana used to date my dad? I can't stop examining every detail on these pages and I quickly notice something. As I get closer and closer to graduation, all of the pictures that include my mom and dad have tear marks through them though they've been carefully taped back together. Whatever happened with my mom and dad and Jana had clearly upset Jana at the time. I close the scrapbook and decide not to look through the others. I already know way more than I wanted to know, though at the same time I feel like I don't know anything at all. Chapter 25, Playing Cards. You're 11, says Jana. She's standing in the doorway to my room. I freeze, my paper mom in one hand and Natalie in the other. Don't you think it's about time you stopped playing with paper dolls? I feel caught, caught with my hands in the chocolate chips bag, caught. I shrug. Jana sits down on the edge of my bed like there's nothing she'd rather be doing than watching me play paper things, though I know that's not the case but I can't play paper things with her there. My paper world is my private world. It doesn't work if there are people watching me. How was work? I asked, placing my people down on the plush couch in my home. Busy, she says. What do you do? 
She opens her arms, looks down at her uniform, and then up to me. I should have noticed. You're a nurse? I ask. Really, Airy, it's as if you and Gage think I didn't exist before I took you in. Of course I'm a nurse. Do you work at the hospital? I work in the ER. I worked in the ER before I became a medical transcriptionist. Now I work in a nursing home. At Parker's? I ask. That's where Gage used to work sometimes, the place where Mr. Linfield cheats at cards. No, not Parker's. How are you feeling? Somewhat better, I say. I have a little quilt wrapped around my legs and my pillow is here on the floor with me. When the room starts to spin, I just lie down for a while. Back in bed, she says, which is what I was afraid she'd say. I pull myself up and start to crawl under the covers. Oh no, pick these up first, she says, sweeping her arm around the whole room. You won't like it if I come in during the night and end up stomping all over them. I wake when Jana strides in with a mug of chicken soup and a handful of crackers. What's it like living in a studio, she asks as I blow on the soup to cool it. The question catches me off guard and I'm glad to have the excuse of the soup to buy me some more time. I hate lying, but Gage fooled Jana into believing we have an apartment and I don't want him to get in trouble. It's cozy. We can't spread our things out though or the place turns into a real mess, I say, staying as close to the truth as possible. Jana is giving me her I thought so look. And then for who knows what reason I blurt out, were you and mama friends for a long time? Your mother was my best friend in high school, she says. I've told you that. I wanted to ask a gazillion more important questions. Questions like, how come you never told me that my dad was your boyfriend? And when did he become mama's boyfriend? And is this why you and mama weren't friends when Gage and I were growing up? And how did it feel when mama called you and told you she was dying and that she wanted to make up, oh... And would you mind raising her two children since her own folks were dead and our dad's parents had never even met us? Gage told me once that they disapproved of our, mad, our, of our dad marrying Mama. I wonder now if it was because they'd been hoping he'd marry Jana instead. But I can't ask Jana any of these questions because I wasn't supposed to be in her room snooping into her scrapbook. Not that she'd likely have answered my questions, anyway. I spend the whole weekend with Jana. She doesn't have to work, so we watch HGTV together. Her favorite show is about a bickering couple. The woman is a decorator and she remodels people's home. While she's fixing the home up, the man is busy trying to persuade the homeowners to sell their house and move somewhere else. My favorite show is House Hunters, which is about people who like Gage and I are looking for the perfect home. I always try to guess which house the people will choose, and most of the time I'm right. Jana tells me I have an eye for real estate, which makes me happy. On Sunday, I'm feeling mostly better except for a cough and a nose that won't stop running. I go to bed early and lie awake a while, wondering if Gage and Jana have talked, wondering how long I'm going to stay at Jana's. I've just drifted off to sleep when I'm awakened by Gage's voice. At first, I'm not sure if I'm awake or dreaming. Welcome to the real world, I hear Jana say. What did you think was going to happen? I didn't think that... <sighs> Gage stops and sighs. It's not a dream. I sit up high on my pillow trying to listen. I can only hear what they're saying when they raise their voices. Just for a little while, that's Gage. What would be just for a little while? Are we moving back? I get out of my bed and stumble closer to the door. It can't always be about you, Gage, what you need. It's not about me. This is about Aerie. Silence. Jana mumbles something and then I hear her say, you know the terms. If she stays, you can't come back in in a week or a month and tell me she's moving in with you again. If she stays, she stays for good. 
I can't go through this again. If she stays, Gage wants me to stay, just me, with no chance of being a family again. I suddenly have difficulty breathing. I crack open my door, wanting to hear more while I quickly pack up my things. We're supposed to stay together, Gage is saying, but he sounds defeated. Your mother never meant for Aerie to suffer the way she has these past weeks. You and I both know that. I've heard about enough. I grab my backpack and walk into the living room. Janet is sitting in the chair by the gas fireplace. Gage is standing, zipping up his coat. I walk over to Gage and take his hand. You're okay, he says, sounding relieved. I wonder what Janet must have told him to make him look so worried. I squeeze his hand. I'm ready to go, I say. After what feels like an eternity, Gage gives a decisive nod. I was only asking for a little more time to put everything in place, he says to Jana, but as usual, things have to be on your terms. We head over to the door to get my shoes. I reach down to put them on and my finger pokes through a hole in the stitching. Gage grabs them out of my hand. You can put them on outside, he says, so you won't leave any tracks in here. But I know the real reason is that he doesn't want Jana to notice what sorry shape they're in. And I realize that today, unlike the day we left, I really made a choice. I chose to go with my brother rather than to stay with Jana. Suddenly I feel more sad than angry. No matter which way I turn, I have to say goodbye to someone I care about, to someone I love. I run back and give Jana a hug. Airy, Jana starts, but Gage pulls me out the door before she can finish. Chapter 26, Rental Agreements. You're not going to school, Airy, Gage says later that morning when I walk out of Briggs's bathroom in my school uniform. Thank goodness we have clean laundry at Briggs. I wonder what Jana did with my shirt, Briggs's shirt that I threw up on. I feel better, I say, which is somewhat true. Showering always makes me feel better. Besides, if I don't go, I'm going to fall further, be further behind. You're behind? Gage asks, putting his uh, chair bed back together. Some, I say. I haven't wanted Gage to know how far behind. I don't want him to think that I haven't been working as hard as he has to keep on top of things. Then stay and get caught up, Gage says. If you go to school and have a relapse, they'll call Jana again. Why can't you just tell them to call you? I ask, though I think I know the answer. You know why, Beniti, he says, trying for a teasing tone. But I can tell he's not feeling especially playful right now. So just stay here and rest up and catch up, too. Stay, says Briggs sitting on the arm of the love seat while attaching his one-stop party shop name tag to his shirt. You can play your paper game. No, she can't, says Gage. If she's well enough to be up, she's well enough to do schoolwork. He sounds just like Jana when he says this, though there's no way I'm going to point that out. Then you can use my laptop, says Briggs, to do research or type up any assignments. But no matter what you do, remember to keep things quiet. I don't want the landlord to know that you're here, especially when I'm not here. I sink down onto the love seat, slightly relieved. It will be great not to have to figure out who to sit with at lunchtime or not to have to face everyone after the snowflake and projectile vomit fiasco, especially Mr. Chandler. And it will be nice too if I can actually finish my report on Louisa May Alcott. Oh, I almost forgot, says Gage, reaching into his Jiffy Lube shirt pocket. Jana gave me this. He pulls out a slip of paper that practically glows. He doesn't have to tell me or Briggs what it is. Anyone who's gone to Eastland knows that a half sheet of paper the color of a pumpkin means one thing. Detention. Tears sock my eyes. I can't believe that I actually got detention. 
But we were trying to do a good thing, I say. Yeah, but you trespassed on school property. If I had known that that's what you and that Daniel kid were up to. But Briggs cuts him off. You're hardly the first hazard to serve detention as an Eastland Tiger. Your brother was known to bend the rules from time to time himself. Or have you forgotten, dude? I looked up at their smirking faces. They're clearly remembering some pranks Gage pulled back in the day when Gage was goofier. Back when Mama was alive. Yeah, but it looks like I'll be the first hazard not to go to Carter, I say. Gage's smile disappears. You'll go to Carter, says Briggs, knocking me playfully on the back of the head, because you're a smart aleck. Now get over here and eat your Cheerios. Gage has to leave first. He stands too long at the door, and I know that he feels nervous about leaving me alone. I'll come back at lunchtime to check up on you, he says. There's not much here to eat, Briggs says. He opens the refrigerator door to reveal two beers, the remaining milk, and a container of sour cream and onion dip. I'll pick something up, says Gage. And still get back to South Port City on time, says Briggs. It's your second week on the job. There's no way you can get here and back on the bus in an hour. It'll be okay, I say to Gage. You don't need to come back. I'll have more Cheerios for lunch. Gage isn't convinced. You can call me to check in, I say. Call me at lunchtime. The alligator lights and the smiley face rugs stare at me now that the guys are gone. I reach into my backpack, intending to pull out my biography of Louisa May Alcott, but my paper things folder catches my eye and I pull it out instead. The folder is so worn and dirty that it feels more like cotton than cardstock. Someday I'd like to buy a binder with more pockets. Then I could divide up my family's, my furniture and the daycare. I run my fingers over the familiar faces and objects in my paper things folder, saying hello to these images that have been such a big part of my life for so many years. I would really like to spread everything out on Briggs's floor, maybe after giving it a quick vacuum, but I promised Gage I'd work on my report today. With a sigh, I put the folder back and I pull my copy of Little Women out of my backpack. I want to add more quotes from the book to support the section of my report where I talk about what a great writer Louisa May Alcott was. I write my new pages on Briggs's computer and then start typing up the pages I wrote over lunch in Mr. O's room. It's pretty slow going though because I'm not the fastest typist in the world. Plus, I have to keep stopping to blow my nose. Around lunchtime, I decide to give my fingers a rest, even though I'm not really hungry yet. I get up and get up and look out the window. Pine Street below is busy, and it's fun to spy on people when they have no idea you're watching them. There are lots of people around Gage's age who go by, and some mothers or maybe nannies with young children. It's sunny out and warmer than it's been. People are peeling off their scarves and unzipping their jackets as they walk. It's hard to believe that it was snowing just a few days ago. One little kid has rubber boots on and is pulling his mother's hand so he can jump in every single puddle. Just when I'm about to turn back to the computer, I see a woman I know. At first, I can't place her. She has a fuzzy hat on and her head is down, but her walk looks so familiar. And then as she passes, it hits me. It's Fran. Fran from Head Start. I rush to my backpack and then out the door. She hears me on my third shout, turns around and walks back up the hill toward me. Airy, what a surprise, she says. We've missed you at Head Start. Then she notices what I'm wearing. You're dressed for school, but you're not in school. Gage wouldn't let me go today. I've had the flu and he wants to make sure that I'm over it. Good idea, says Fran, shifting her messenger bag from one shoulder to the other. But shouldn't you be wearing a coat? I'm okay, I assure her. It's nice out, and I only came outside to give you this. I hold Reggie's plane out to her. Oh, wow! Fran takes the plane and examines it closely. It's a beauty. He's one talented guy, your airplane man. It's a hell plane, I tell her. 
He chose it for you because it has two points, the way a bicycle has two wheels. Fran smiles. I almost hate to let it go, she says. Where do you think I should fly it? Are you walking to Head Start now, I ask. Fran nods. Well, to the bus stop, she clarifies. I try to picture a high place between here and the bus stop. There's that church nearby, the big white one. Maybe you could get up into the bell tower. I expect Fran to dismiss this idea, but instead she seems to be considering it. I can come with you if you want, I offer. This definitely sounds like more fun than typing, and I'd love to see Reggie's hellplane fly. She laughs, and I realize that I don't hear Fran laugh much. Now Carol, she laughs all the time. But Fran, she keeps her feelings more to herself. I don't think that's what your brother had in mind for you today. In fact, you'd better get back inside. It may be a nice day, but you can still catch a chill. She thanks me again for the plane and has me promise to tell Reggie how grateful she is to him. To him. We say our goodbyes and I head back into the apartment building. As I trudge my still wobbly legs up the stairs, it occurs to me that Fran must live in the same neighborhood as Briggs. It probably takes her an hour to get to Head Start between the walk to the center of Port City and the bus ride to the East End. Now I know why she's so desperate to get a bike. If she had a bike, she could ride directly down Commercial Street and be in the East End in a third of the time, maybe even less. I arrive at the door of Briggs' apartment and turn the doorknob. It doesn't turn. I use both hands to twist the knob as hard as I can, but of course it still doesn't turn. It's locked. I push on the door, hoping it didn't really shut all the way, that the force of my push would make the door pop open. It doesn't. I try the doorknob again. The door is locked and I don't have a key and Gage and Briggs aren't coming back for hours. Oh, and I can't go to the landlord, even if I knew which unit was his, because Gage and I aren't supposed to be staying here anymore. Despite the warmer weather conditions, it's cold in this hall. I don't know anyone in this building. I don't have a coat. I haven't eaten my lunch. Just then, the phone rings inside the apartment. It's probably Gage calling to see if I'm okay. Holy moly, what have I gotten myself into? I hear footsteps coming down the hall. What if it's the landlord? I dash back down the stairs and out the door so I won't be seen near Briggs' apartment. A man leaves, but I have no idea if it was the landlord or not. Not knowing what else to do, I crouch against the wall of the building across the street. People glance at me as they pass by, and I can tell that they're wondering if they should stop wondering if they should do something for me, but no one does. An hour passes, maybe more. The day starts to get cooler and a fog rolls in. I can't afford to get sick again. Reluctantly, I go back inside where I lean against Briggs's door and wait. I'm folded up, my head on my knees. It seems like hours have passed, though I'm not sure how many, when I suddenly hear Gage's voice. What are you doing out here, Airy? He is as angry as I had feared. That's when I started to cry. Up until this moment, I was just worried, worried and cold, but now I'm sobbing. I saw Fran and I ran out to give her the airplane. Why didn't you take a key? I didn't think of it, I'm so sorry. You didn't think at all, Airy, he shouts. He looks around quickly, and I can tell he's remembering the warning about the landlord. He lowers his voice, but it still hits me like fists. I kept calling, and you didn't answer. I had to leave work early. It's only my second week, and I had to tell them I had a family emergency. I don't think I've ever seen Gage this mad, this disappointed in me. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I re repeat between sobs. I thought of asking someone in the street if I could use their phone, but I was afraid you'd come home if you knew that I was locked out. I didn't want you to get in trouble. Well, you should have thought of all of that before you ran out. I know. I know. 
Gage sighs an enormous sigh and then slides down to sit next to me. It's not your fault. It's mine, he says, resting his head on the door. And then to my surprise, a tear runs down his cheek too. I'm the one who lied to Jana and said we had an apartment. I'm the one who drags you all over the city carrying all your belongings in your backpack. I'm the one who gets mad at you when you're sick, who can't give you more than Cheerios for breakfast and for lunch. I don't care about any of that, I say, and I mean it. You take really good care of me, Gage. You do. He gives me a look that tells me he doesn't believe me, so I tick off the evidence on my fingers. You won't let me be around inappropriate behavior. You make me do my homework. You sleep with me in the storage closet at Lighthouse, even though you could have a bed on the boys' floor. You give me fashion tips. He looks at me when I say this, one eyebrow up. I can see a little smile on his lips. I move to a new finger. You came back to make sure I was okay, even though you knew you might get fired. You came back. Always, Beniti, he says. Always. Chapter 27, Detention Slips. I'm alone sitting at a giant wooden table in the conference room, serving my detention. The room has two doors, one right off the school office and the other off the hall. I keep my head lowered, focused on my report, so I don't see the kids who pass by the doors on their way home, and so I can pretend they don't see me. Yesterday at Briggs's, I copied down a few of my favorite Louisa May Alcott quotes, which I'm hoping to use in my paper somewhere. There's one quote in particular that I keep reading over and over again. What do girls do who haven't any mothers to help them through their troubles? And I want to say, yeah, what do such girls do? Please tell me. What would my mother say about my slippery slide from being a shiny, gifted student to one who has to serve detention? One whose teachers and even her best friend seem to have given up on? I'm rereading the other quotes to see how I might work them into my paper when Daniel slips in through the hall door. I glance around, hoping he wasn't seen. Haven't you already done detention? He nods and he plunks down in a seat. You wouldn't talk to me in class. You kept talking when we weren't supposed to, and now you're talking to me here and you're not supposed to. You're going to get us both in trouble, I say, again. Hey, he taps his fingers lightly on the table. You're the one who wanted a secret spring blizzard, remember? He has a point, and he's kind enough not to mention that it was my glitter that caused the most problems. I give a long sigh. I guess it doesn't matter now if I get in trouble again, I say, leaning back in my chair. This detention has probably sealed my fate, as Mademoiselle Barbary likes to say. And that fate doesn't include Carter. Why does Carter matter so much to you anyway? It's not so much better than Wilson. Lots of reasons, I say. Tell me one. My mother wanted me to go there. It was basically her dying wish. Daniel looks at me sympathetically. After a long silence, he says softly, but why do you want to go there? I open my mouth, expecting the answer to be right there on the tip of my tongue, but nothing comes out. I close my mouth and think about it, really think about it. I've lost a lot of things in my life, I say slowly. Right now, I still have Eastland Elementary. I belong here, but after that? I pause for a moment, trying to gather my thoughts. To me, Carter feels like a place where I could belong. It's where everyone in my family went. Mama and Dad, Gage, even Jana. It's a part of my history, but it's also my future. I shrug, feeling suddenly self-conscious. Anyway, that's why I want to go to Carter. Daniel is smiling, and I think he's going to make fun of me, but instead he says, and that's why you care about the Eastland traditions. 
He's right. I never did work up the courage to say as much to Mr. Chandler, but to me, the Eastland elementary traditions aren't just about getting to stop work to cut paper or wearing funny hats. They're about feeling like you belong somewhere, that you're part of a shared history, part of a family. So when do you want to do Crazy Hat Day? Daniel asks. <laughs> I laugh. Somehow I don't think Mr. Chandler intended for us to hatch our next plot while sitting in detention. But what do I have to lose at this point, really? I've already got one detention on my record, and if it's too late for me to get into Carter, at least it's not too late for me to revive another of my favorite Eastland traditions. Together, Daniel and I make a plan for the next step of our campaign. Then, just as we're leaving, I point to another Louisa May Alcott quote from my notes. This one makes me think of you, I tell Daniel shyly. He reads it silently. A faithful friend is a strong defense, and he that hath found him hath found a treasure. And when he smiles, it really is like finding a treasure. That's all of Paper Things for this week. We'll be back next week to read more chapters together.